Welcome to Bolsover Castle, Derbyshire. It's 1068, and William the Conqueror grants custody of his new castle at Nottingham and the large manor of Bolsover to one of his knights, William Peveril of Castleton, Derbyshire, who may possibly have been his illegitimate son. Peveril's son would later forfeit his family estates to the crown after allegedly poisoning Ranulf, Earl of Chester, in 1153. The First Baron's War raged in England from 1215 to 1217. Rebellious landowners led by Robert Fitzwalter revolting against despotic King John who refused to accept and abide by the terms of the Magna Carta that he'd signed only the year before. Sensing a wider sympathy for the rebels, many of King John's supporters switched sides. John fled to Winchester and Louis, heir to the French throne, invaded without protest being proclaimed king at St Paul's Cathedral in London. England was in uproar. King John sold the Lordship of Bolsover to William de Ferrers, but the castle governor Brian de Lille refused to hand over the property. Bolsover fell to the Ferrers' forces under a bloody siege in 1216. The castle garrison was stood down in 1322, but it wouldn't be the last time the walls would fall. King Edward VI granted Bolsover to Francis Talbot, the 5th Earl of Shrewsbury, in 1553. Two Scottish members of the household were suspected of being in collusion with Mary, Queen of Scots, passing letters to her at nearby Chatsworth House, where she was being held by George Talbot, the 6th Earl of Shrewsbury. George's son Gilbert was none too fond of the castle, when his father died in 1590, he sold the estate to his stepbrother, Sir Charles Cavendish, son of Bess of Hardwick and Sir William Cavendish. Sir William was the second husband of Bess of Hardwick and a trusted advisor to Sir Cardinal Thomas Wolsey and Henry VIII. His lineage was notable and we would assume enough to open any door, but in Cavendish's life of Wolsey, it was written... Sir William Cavendish had a liberal education given him by his father, who settled upon him also certain lands in the county of Suffolk, but made a much better provision for him by procuring him to be admitted into the family of the great Cardinal Wolsey, upon whom he waited in quality of gentleman usher of his chamber. Sir William would remain faithful to Wolsey during his fall and showed him every kindness. It should not have been such a surprise to capture Thomas's name at the family seat. I can only assume that the speaker in this clip is referring to Sir Henry Cavendish, first son of Bess and Sir William. <laughs> The medieval remains provided an ideal setting for the imposing new little castle. Nothing remained of the original medieval building it replaced. Only a section of the garden wall sits atop of part of the old inner bailey wall. Sir Charles Cavendish designed Bolsover with Robert Smithson as a retreat from his principal seat at nearby Welbeck Abbey. You might find it shocking to learn that women and children, not men, were employed in the removal of old walls and fetching new stone from nearby quarries. The sad and lonely figure of a small lady dressed in black is said to linger in the shadows of Bolsover. Was she one of the unfortunate workers, or maybe one of the hundreds who were buried in the plague pit? Sir Charles would die before his mansion was complete but son William took on the project, renovating the old house from 1617 to 1633, with state apartments, a gallery and a hall. On completion, Charles I and Queen Henrietta would bring their royal entourage to dine at Bolsover. 
The menu consisted of 41 types of bird, including peacocks and swans, and cost him £15,000. The king and queen would visit on three occasions, although following feasts were considerably less lavish, at around £4,000. Lord Clarendon, an attending member of Gentry, remarked that it was such an excess of feasting as had scarce ever been known in England before. As Privy Councillor and Commander-in-Chief of the Northern Royalist Counties during the Civil War of 1642-51, William was treading on treacherous ground. The castle was garrisoned for the King by Major General Crewe in 1644, however his tenure would be short. Parliament ordered the destruction of Bolsover to prevent it being used by Royalists in 1649. William fled to Paris after the death of his wife Elizabeth and defeat at the Battle of Master Moor. It was 1660 when William returned from France with his second wife Margaret Lucas to begin restoring the estates. At Bolsover they installed the state apartment in the terrace range and built the riding house complete with its own smithy and stables. Riding master to Charles II, Cavendish was considered to be an equine authority. His book Method, a new invention of the dressage of horses, was widely praised at the time and he gave personal demonstrations of his unique approach. The ghostly sound of stamping horse hooves still echo in the castle. William was proud of his war horses. Trained not to flinch in battle, they stamped on the heads of fallen soldiers, crushing their skulls. The voices recorded here demonstrate the speaker's awareness of me, but I wasn't carrying anything other than the recorder. By 1676, the castle had been restored to good order. William Cavendish was a man who loved to splash his money about town. He was a patron of the arts and a socialite, but died with huge debts, passing Bolsover to his son Henry. Henry, a Tory politician, would be second and last Duke of Newcastle upon Tyne. His marriage to Francis Pierre Pont was to provide him with six daughters but no son to carry his title. Lady Henrietta Cavendish Hollis, Countess of Oxford, granddaughter of Sir Henry Cavendish, inherited the estate in 1716. She lived at Welbeck Abbey in Nottinghamshire, rarely visiting Bolsover, and carried out only minimal maintenance on the buildings, resulting in the terrace range falling into further decay. Bolsover passed through marriage to William Henry Cavendish Scott Bentinck, 4th Duke of Portland, Marquess of Titchfield in the 1770s. Although he dearly loved the castle and wanted for his remains to be laid in the open churchyard, he was laid to rest in the Cavendish family vault. The neglect of the iconic terrace overlooking the Vale of Scarsdale was allowed to continue. In 1770 the roof had gone, when it was recorded as being in an artistic ruinous state in 1777. Despite the terrace kitchen being a shell of its former self and requiring rather a keen imagination to see it as it once was, visitors have reported seeing a young maid holding a bundle of clothes and throwing something into what was a fireplace. Legend has it a young woman of the household became pregnant and feeling extreme shame threw her baby into the fire. Son of a Glaswegian merchant, advocate and alumnus of Wardening College, Oxford, Reverend John Hamilton Gray became curate of Bolsover, leasing the little castle as its guardian from the 4th Duke of Portland in 1833. He lived here with his wife Elizabeth and daughter Caroline until the year before his death, carrying out alterations and repairs to the little house, now the little castle. 
the fountain garden, with its central statue of Venus, has private nooks and rooms around its perimeter. Perfect for an intimate meeting, away from prying eyes. Over the years, many visitors whilst walking in the garden have reported either seeing a little boy in old-fashioned clothing, or feeling a small child gently grasp their hand. The room I peeped into even has a fire for a winter tryst, despite the autumn weather being quite mild. Here in the semi-darkness there was a distinct chill in the air. Sensing a gentleman to be with me, but not being able to see him, I call out. Not only do I receive his name, but recognition of my name too. Who's the gentleman who's with me? Can you say hello, sir? Who's the gentleman who's with me? You say hello, sir. Who's the gentleman who's with me? You say hello, sir. Circling the garden, the newly restored wall walk gives access to incredible views over the surrounding countryside and the grounds of Bolsover. If you linger too long and find yourself here when the clock strikes midnight, you may see the grey lady wafting the paths, oblivious to your presence. It's not only the voice of a woman I capture on the battlements, but a gentleman who asks of my location. Maybe he's not able to see me. Walking around here, they're not really the battlements, because they... Oh, they're not really the battlements, because they... Oh, they're not really the battlements, because they... This was my first time at Bolsover, a clear sunny day's outing while I was staying on the nearby Hardwick estate. I was aware of the Cavendish's family history, but I knew little about the castle other than its ghostly residence. Having visited many historic locations, I tried to keep an open mind on anecdotal stories, balancing them with my own impressions and recordings that I capture. Bolsover though was a first for me, and setting my foot inside the door, the atmosphere in the little castle put me on edge. It wasn't only that I felt under surveillance, it was more that I wasn't welcome. Formerly the drawing room, Sir William Cavendish is said to haunt the pillar room, which was made to his design. Lights have been reported to float across this room, and electrical pranks played on staff and visitors. Starting with a rather hostile EVP in the castle, my feelings proved to be correct. The first voice I captured lets me know that I am indeed under their watchful gaze. Used for formal dining and hosting audiences, the Star Chamber is the most flamboyant room of the castle. With tapestries depicting scenes from the Bible's Old and New Testaments, it provided evidence of wealth and status to those lucky enough to receive an invitation. By now, the hairs on my arms were raised, and when I heard the EVP, it confirmed that I wasn't in friendly company. If their intention was to intimidate me, it didn't work, but I did feel the sensation you get when walking into a room where something unpleasant is taking place. Used as a withdrawing room from the Star Chamber, the marble closet was another room designed to wow the guests. The scarlet curtains hint at how bright it might have looked when it was decorated with the original tapestries. I can't express how much I didn't like being in this room. Not only were the colours jarring, it felt like something unspeakably horrible had taken place. I'm not going to say what I believe happened, only that it was ceremonial and ungodly. The 
voices I captured are modern, but come from speakers who are obviously well aware of their deceased status. Maybe they died en route to the castle, or possibly they're just visitors from their side. Either way, I'm glad they didn't sense me. <laughs> This room may have been a nursery, but it felt cold and unloved to me. It might have been the diminishing light or the lack of heating, but there was definitely a chill as I looked out of the window. The voice I recorded here is of a younger male, and his message reflects his age. Although bare now, William's bedchamber would have been furnished with heavy tapestries to decorate the room and to keep out the draughts. Three closets and a private storeroom made for a rather luxurious suite of rooms. Depicting the ascension of Jesus to the heavenly realm, the ceiling is almost palatial in its scale and decoration. Its many cupboards built into the panelling would likely have been used to store precious objects and papers. There are some notable academics in the Cavendish family. Henry Cavendish was a notable Peterhouse scholar, philosopher and scientist. Without knowing which Lady Cavendish the speaker refers to in the next clip, we can't be sure of the link. However, the name Cavendish is closely tied with the Ivy League College, founded in 1746. The Elysium Closet was an inner sanctum for Cavendish. He could close himself off here to all but the most important, highly valued guest. Access was by invitation only. An unusual EVP captured here was to lead me down a rather curious rabbit hole. William Cavendish Bentinck, the sixth Duke of Portland, was a courtier, Tory MP and landowner at Borsover. The Borsover Collier Company was founded in 1889 by Emerson Musjamp Bainbridge to extract coal on Portland's estate. Cavendish also owned valuable lead mines, and this was the clue I needed. At the end of the 17th century, miners from Saxony, Germany were invited to Bolsover to share their expertise on the use of explosives. The first speaker of the EVP issues another threat. The second speaker provides a location. Note his accent is neither local to Bolsover or Germanic. Looks oh, almost ceremonial. <laughs> Looks almost ceremonial. Letting in lots of light, the lantern sits above the central meeting point of rooms on the second floor. Its architecture demonstrates the wealth of Cavendish. Regardless of the bright light, my feeling here was devoid of all happiness. Whilst the surroundings were still grand, I felt distant and I wasn't sure why. As I looked up into the sun, a voice is captured. I wish I'd heard them calling. I wouldn't have felt so alone. <laughs> Visitors and staff have reported seeing the ghostly figure of the Victorian lady, all in white in the castle. Might they have seen the shade of Mrs. Robin, housekeeper to the Greys, still faithfully carrying out her duties? There are three external entrances to the kitchens and a descending staircase from the ground floor.
The servery was a busy hub of the working kitchen, receiving supplies and the provision of plated food for the tables above. The three ovens and nearby dry store allowed for a huge spread of sweet and savoury dishes. For a castle this size, the ovens are large and reminded me of nearby Hardwick Hall, although their condition is nowhere near as good. It's not often that I record a speaker mentioning numerical figures. I wasn't born in 69, so I can only assume that his counting stops in the kitchen. 69, that's right. 69, Standing in front of me was a burly large man wearing a full length white apron. He didn't look particularly friendly and his face was wrinkled in anger. I wasn't surprised when I heard the EVP. I knew I wasn't welcome here. I can see someone in a long white apron. Big man. I can see someone in a long white apron. Big man. I can see someone in a long white apron. Big man. The large stone sorting vats in the wet larder have seen a lot of service. And in more recent years, it looks to have been used as a scullery. The materials in the room seem to suck what little warmth there was from the air. The voice I captured sounds echoed, lonely and distant. I hope they heard my voice. It's time to leave Bolsover Castle. Thank you for your company and for watching until the end. I hope you'll subscribe to join me on my next EVP adventure. Bye for now.